This was In the Pale Dub Light by Sumana Hariharashwara. Welcome to Passionate Voices. Welcome, Sumana. Hi there, Eric. How's it going today? Good. How are you? Um, I'm so good. It's good to see you. Good to see you, too. So for our viewers, a quick summary. Sumana is a technology manager, a writer, a coder, a community organizer, um, born in New Jersey, um, moved to Pennsylvania, Missouri, uh, Northern California before coming to New York and also has been involved in uh, open source for a long time. Uh, Simona, what is your passion? I would say I have two main passions. One of them is making people laugh uh, through stand-up comedy, through extremely silly web apps and uh, my writing and things like that, and the fan vid that you just saw, for instance. Mm -hmm. And uh, But the other passion, the one that I spend more time on and certainly have been spending a lot of my career on, is I really care a lot about empowering people, especially marginalized and traditionally underprivileged people using technology. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that means working on technology that does that empowering, mm -hmm. such as MediaWiki, the software behind Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it means teaching people how to be better users of technology through uh, making or leading trainings and tutoring people, mentoring people, and so on. And sometimes it means helping get lots of different diverse people into the world of making technology so that we can all empower ourselves. And so, for instance, I've been involved in a lot of diversity efforts on different scales and at different parts of the pipeline, involved in getting diverse people of diverse demographics, talents, abilities, and backgrounds into open source software so that we can all make this software together that we're all using to improve our own lives. So Simon, how did you get involved in open source in the first place? My origin story is a guy named Seth Schoen. Mm -hmm. Seth Schoen is a uh, technologist currently at the Electronic Freedom uh, Frontier Foundation. Sorry, mm -hmm. like everybody else, I accidentally say freedom when I should say frontier. Um, but Back in 1998, when we met, we were both undergraduates at the University of California at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, was hanging out with nerds. Uh, these were the kinds of geeks who made fun of me because I referred to individual Star Trek The Next Generation episodes by title instead of star date. So clearly that made me a humanities person. <laughs> um, and uh, I through one of them met this guy who was introduced to me partly as, man, he's such a free software zealot. He won't use Windows at all. Mm -hmm. And that was Seth Schoen. And Seth introduced me to the side of open source and free software that's about empowering ourselves and everybody by making sure that everybody has control over the software that we use and that in some sense controls us. The connection between that and all these other values that I care a lot about, like everybody having a say, everybody having a fair chance. And he introduced me, for instance, to Slashdot, which at the time was sort of the open source New York Times, uh, and which incidentally is uh, through a series of links, the way that I met Leonard Richardson, who is mm -hmm. now my husband, actually, mm -hmm. uh, and who has been sort of my uh, partner in these in a lot of these endeavors for the past decade plus. And so Seth, was a fantastic mentor and guide. He was the kind of guy, and still is absolutely the kind of guy, where you ask him a question because you don't have enough information, and it would never even cross his mind to think of ridiculing you or using that as an opportunity for a dominance display. He always thought really deeply about, hold on, what do you need to understand here that you didn't understand that caused you to ask this question? And then he would help you build your mental model. and he was such a gentle teacher to me exactly when I needed it. And so to me, that's what open source is. He was my role model, not just in terms of trying to live values like freedom and mm -hmm. uh, free speech and empowering each other. And it was very soon after that that I switched to Linux in, mm -hmm. the, in the late 90s, which meant I had to deal with hand configuring PPP and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but also he was my guide and my role model in seeing what this world is and ought to be in terms of all of us sharing and teaching each other. And mm -hmm. I recently talked to somebody else who said that his role model in getting into open source had been Linus Torvalds. And so he had learned mm -hmm. 
to take people down. He had learned that the way you build yourself up is by shouting at others mm -hmm. and being quite rude and snarky to them because then there will be people who applaud you for that clever snarkiness. And I'm very, very grateful that in 1998, that's not who I ran into. Mm -hmm. And where do you think that comes from, that snarkiness that you sometimes find in open source communities? Do you have a theory around like how these behaviors develop and why people exhibit them? I find that basically all the human communities that I've ever been a part of include some elements of people being competitive and of people being nurturing and collaborative. I think if I look in open source, I can find both of those things. If I look in the community of people who read and write romance novels, I've recently started reading romance, mm -hmm. um, then I would also find that if you look yeah. in sports. I mean, you'll find that anywhere. And I think that the Linux kernel community bears very strongly the stamp of the person who founded it and who by norm, the conversations are normative. Part of how we know what is okay to say is we look at what other people are saying, right? And we look at what people get uh, praise or punishment for doing. And I think that that's part of what people see. I think there's also, of course, um, as I say, pockets and corners, right? You look at the Python community and you look at how Guido Van Rossum has acted in his capacity as a leader for many, many years. And overall, you're going to see there is some snark, there's humor. You watch his keynote from PyCon this year, PyCon North America in Montreal, that just happened last month, and you hear laughter, but it's gentle laughter and it's often self-deprecating laughter. Mm -hmm. He talked, he spent a tremendous amount of his keynote talking about the reasons on a genuine, legitimate, understandable psychological level and sort of a life cycle level, why projects go unmaintained and fall mm -hmm. into disrepair. And so he approached that question not from, okay, now we need to punish those people and I'm gonna make fun of those people, uh, kind of a perspective, but he said, this is going to happen. This is a natural part of life. Let us engage in useful conversations so that those tasks can then get taken up by the next generation, which seems to me to be a much healthier approach. And so I think there's some amount of top-down leadership and role models and whatnot. I think there's also some element that, of, uh, some element of, it is a simple fact that text online, because it doesn't bear with it things like body language, mm -hmm and t oral tone, it is easy for us as risk averse creatures, as insecure people to read even neutral words as hostile. I ran into this many times myself as a community manager, people who do code review know it, people who are trying to give written criticism even to people in a peer writing group or something like that know it. And we, we added emoticons to mm -hmm. our lives partly in order to help compensate for this. And I think in that environment, sometimes it's easy to just go with it, to go with that current and to go with that flow and say, well, if it's going to be read as hostile anyway, perhaps this even happens on a subconscious level, then I may as well hone that. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people, I'm actually a little bit jealous of the people who decided from a young age on the internet that they would try playing around with being known through different identities mm. and hide behind pseudonyms and hone their flaming skills and stuff like that because it is a genuinely valuable skill to be able to be rude to somebody else on the internet in such a way that other people will applaud you and back you up i do not have that skill and one reason why i don't have that skill is because i never practiced it because from a very young age i decided everything that I said on the public internet, I was going to sign my entire name to. And from a very young age, I knew that was going to be an unusual and unique calling card. And I would not be able to hide. There would, I, would never, I would never be able to say, it was that other Sumana Hari Hareshwara who said those terrible things. So I didn't learn that skill. And that's one reason why uh, there are kinds of leadership 
that no one calls leadership generally that I am not going to be able to do. So what I'm hearing you say in, in that is also that um, if I'm a founder of an open source or a free culture community, I have a choice in what kind of community I'm going to create. I can, I can create a community that sort of rewards the sort of snarky behavior that you're part of the club if you joke about other members who are not part of the club or non-members who, who want to join the club. Um, or you, you can be a community that mentors and teaches and that, that has a healthy culture. And it sounds like you've encountered both and uh, yes. your free culture and open source travel. So can you tell me a little bit more uh, about sort of the upsides and the downsides, the, the different types of communities that you've encountered and the kinds of behaviors beyond like that initial mentorship experience uh, that you talked about? Sure, sure, absolutely. When you said, oh, you know, you have a choice about whether you create, what kind of culture you create. One really, really valuable emblematic example to look at is Dreamwith. Mm -hmm. Mark and Denise, Denise Pellucci, uh, founders of Dreamwith, for, from the very beginning decided that what they wanted was a culture of people helping each other, of people feeling empowered, of teaching each other, of never having to feel like they had to one-up somebody else. And so for instance, I remember one day looking through my email and seeing in the news from Dreamwith, because anybody who's a Dreamwith member automatically gets notifications every several weeks or several months when the people who make Dreamwith put out sort of a here's what's new report. Denise said, hey, I see that some of you are saying good things about Dreamwith in non-Dreamwith places mm -hmm. so that more people can join and that's great. It's just, and that's great. But some of you are saying negative things about our competitors along the way. And that's not okay. And anybody who's currently using one of these competing services like LiveJournal, I don't want Dreamwith to ever be considered a, a place in a community where it's okay to be mocking or insulting them. Mm -hmm. And I, I cried a little bit seeing that kind of leadership and that kind of value setting, right? From the, the founder of a person who had previously worked at LiveJournal and who had left and started a competing service partly because she's not happy with the way that LiveJournal is going. I mean, I'm not, Denise, I'm not speaking for her, but it is a competitor. She is competing against them, but she's decided that there are things that are not okay along the way of that competition. There's an Australian general who recently made some uh, remarks about fighting sexual harassment in the Australian military forces who said that the standard you walk past is the standard you accept. Mm -hmm. And I have definitely tried to live that. When you don't know the people that you're trying to persuade, that can be difficult. I know that when I was at the Wikimedia Foundation, I started there in early 2011 as a community manager for MediaWiki. And it wasn't until several months later that I introduced a code of conduct for our physical spaces. And I was extremely limited about it. I said, I want this to be a code of conduct for our face-to-face -face technical events that are sponsored by the Wikimedia Foundation. Because I knew that I had the social capital, that I had people backing me up, including you, Eric, actually. Uh, Eric was above me in the chain of command when we were both at WMF in those days uh, so many years ago now. And I knew that I had the social capital with our volunteers in the community and also the community members who worked at the Wikimedia Foundation that they would support this. Mm -hmm. And now I am very happy to see that there have been ripple effects of community members seeing that working and taking that cause into other Wikimedia community spaces that have very little to do with the Wikimedia Foundation, other chapters, 
Wikimania, the yearly get together. And now there's discussion at the Wikimedia Foundation and in other spaces about how do we expand this? How do we help people feel safer in all Wikimedia spaces, online and offline? And it seems to me that, and I, I wrote up actually a case study about how I did this that I'll make sure you have the link to so you can put it in the show notes if you like. I was only able to do so much because I came in in 2011, 10 years after a lot of the initial culture had gelled and set. Mm -hmm. And this was a very different experience than, for instance, coming into alt law where I did some product management work and I was talking to and friends with the one person who was the main developer on the project. A large project, people uh, often make this comparison, and it is a bit of a cliche, it's like that aircraft carrier that has a lot of momentum but takes a lot of time to turn around. And one thing I'm excited about in my next endeavors is being part of projects where there are fewer stakeholders, honestly, and there's more room to innovate and change and grow, and where the culture isn't so set in some things that I find not so pleasing. So uh, can you talk a little bit more about the codes of conduct and the friendly space policy, like especially for people who haven't followed those discussions in open free culture communities, like what is the motivation to have those those codes in the first place? Like one argument that people might make is, well, um, you should know what good behavior looks like. You should know what bad behaviors uh, look like. Why do we have to spell it out for people? I think that we all know in any community, in any group endeavor, as Jefferson said, if men were angels, we would have no need of government. And if you show me any community of people trying to get something done together for longer than the course of, let's say, five people making one individual small object or artifact, any ongoing community, any community that is prides itself on being open and inclusive where there's not particularly that much gatekeeping about who can join and where the goal is to make stuff together. There are all sorts of things that don't quite go the way that it should because we are not angels. There are bugs that pile up and don't get addressed. There is code that comes in, patches that come in that doesn't get reviewed. There are people write code with bugs in it in the first place. People accidentally spill things on each other. Uh, people, especially before Git, people would accidentally overwrite each other's work on the same chunk of code. And so we come up with procedures to help ourselves keep from making mistakes that come out of negligence, and also ways to stop people from misbehaving in ways that indicate, unfortunately, malicious intent, because there's nothing magic. But any of these communities that stops people from malicious intent or people who are careless from joining them and being malicious or careless in them. And we see and we have seen and we continue to see that in approximately every community ever made by humans, some people will accidentally or through malicious intent hurt each other in various ways. And there are some communities that don't have any particular mechanisms to deal with that, and which in fact have anti-mechanisms. Uh, they have norms that prioritize secrecy and no one ever being expelled from the group and so on over anyone's safety or even the ability of the group to continue on whatever mission that it has, such as making stuff together. And so there are people who have left communities quietly or who have filed bug reports on the way out about ways that they have been hurt and in, in big and small ways or otherwise just prevented from doing things that help move everything forward. And so just as with any bug report, I figure we have a responsibility to listen and to make amends and try and fix these institutions so that we can get on with the job of, of making good stuff together to help everybody. 
Yeah, and, and I think a lot of people in open communities um, accept the notion that there there are some rules and guidelines that govern the behavior within the community, right? And it's been for for a long time. For example, many open communities have had bugzilla and bug tracker related rules of engagement. But when it comes to these physical events, uh, it's like, well, that's a new idea. We, we're going to have like some kind of code, except it's not a new idea. That we've had these codes for Wikipedia editing. We've had these codes for. Uh, submitting a bug or submitting code for review. Uh, you had mentioned Linus earlier, Linus Torvalds, and uh, as, you, as you say, Linus is a little bit notorious for often making like comments that are insulting and demeaning um, on mailing lists. Um, and I don't know if, if that's gotten better recently or not um, uh, at all, but uh, he did recently merge this a change that someone had proposed, which was, he called it a code of conflict, which I thought in itself was an interesting choice that, that speaks a little bit um, to his perspective. Um, and um, can you talk a little bit more about sort of the differences between the, the Linus Torvalds code of conflict type approach versus the types of friendly space uh, um, policies and uh, codes of conduct for open source communities that uh, you would advocate for that other organizations would advocate for. Where, where do you see the differences? And maybe I'll show the uh, the code of con um, code of conflict um, as well as some of the other policies while we talk. So, um, sure. such as the friendly space policy, right? Yeah. So this is the the change that was merged into the uh, Linux uh, on kernel repository, and it literally has the summary here: code of conflict. Uh, Linux kernel development effort is a very personal process compared to traditional ways of developing software. Your code and ideas behind it will be carefully reviewed, often resulting in critique and criticism. Uh, review will almost always require improvements to the code before it can be included in the kernel. Note that this happens because everyone involved wants to see the best possible solution for the overall success of Linux. And then it goes on later. If, however, anyone feels personally abused, threatened, or otherwise uncomfortable due to this process, that is not acceptable. If so, please contact the Linux Foundation's Technical Advisory Board at et cetera, or the individual members, and they will work to resolve the issue to the best of their ability. So that's the, the Linux kernel model, and I can pull up maybe the Wikimedia Foundation friendly space policy. Space policy for Wikimedia Foundation events, mm -hmm. dedicated to providing a harassment-free venue and conference experience for everyone, regardless of gender, sexual orientation, disability, physical appearance, race, ethnicity, political affiliation, or religion, and not limited to these aspects. We do not tolerate any form of harassment or of conference participants. Uh, sexual language and imagery is not appropriate for any conference, venue, or talks. Participants violating these rules may be sanctioned or expelled from the conference at the discretion of the organizers. So this is, of course, for a different type of conduct, specifically about um, yes. conferences and venues and uh, the kernel uh, code of conflict is, I'm assuming, more about things like mailing list discussions, code review comments, uh, things well, like that. Well, and it doesn't explicitly say that, mm -hmm. it right? Doesn't. It doesn't explicitly say that it's only about online behavior. And so, in fact, when it comes to scope, the code of conflict that the Linux Technical Advisory Board has jurisdiction over has more scope than the friendly space policy, which only covers face-to-face -face conferences as written. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that there are people who have used the uh, the Wikimedia Foundation friendly space policy as a jumping off point to talk about online safety and nurturing hospitable environments as well. Mm -hmm. But that isn't really where that is. Now, I think that it would probably do well to talk a little bit here about liberty and hospitality which is a spectrum that I started thinking a lot about when I attended the Recurse Center, formerly known as Hacker School, in late 2013, and I then returned in late 2014. The Recurse Center is a very designed space, and it is very unlike a lot of open communities in that 
the center of it is a physical place. Everyone's there for the same reason, not just the same overall mission, but everybody's there to become better programmers. There is gatekeeping, there is an admissions process. And I think, and it's, it's quite small, you know, but there's also things we can learn from that. I ended up giving a talk called Hospitality Jerks and what I learned as the keynote address of Wiki Conference USA last year in 2014 that got some fair amount of attention, partly because of the thing I'm going to talk about here. Liberty is a way of approaching community, which is to say the most important thing is that everybody gets to do what they want, is everybody, unless there is some kind of legal restriction against it, ought to say and do whatever they want. And that's in part the goal of the community. Hospitality is an approach that says, by all, everybody should try to help each other out mm -hmm. in a compassionate way to make each other happier citizens and help each other fulfill goals together. And where making someone else uncomfortable is a thing you actively strive not to do. Mm -hmm. I think there's a nuance there around the word comfort that I want to make sure I get at here. When I was at hacker school, it was meant to be a place where people felt safe. And it is okay for us ourselves to push ourselves out of our comfort zones by doing things that we had never tried before, things that we personally were afraid we would fail at. but it certainly would not be okay for us to make ourselves or anybody else feel unsafe. And by that same token then, often because you can't necessarily tell what's going to make someone else feel uncomfortable versus unsafe, if you are taking an attitude of hospitality, probably sometimes you wanna err on the side of not doing something if you have a worry that it's going to make someone else feel actively unsafe. Uh, unless you have some kind of pre-existing agreement with that person that says it's okay for us to push each other out of our comfort zone and if something turns into a feeling of unsafety then we'll talk about that. Honestly, frankly, one of the only places that people talk about this sort of stuff with any nuance is in the BDSM community because it's one of the few places where people talk about power and consent and what is or is not okay to uh, take as a risk mm. in terms of its consequences and how to think through that and how to have approaches that think about it. Anyway, the Linux kernel community for some time has had a reputation as a place that takes a much more liberty style approach where there are a few rules that stop us from doing some things when it comes to our speech, our discourse and how we treat each other. But other than that, very free for all. And it seems as though the very first sentence of this, which says it's a very personal process mm -hmm. compared to traditional ways of developing software, is an interesting phrasing, right? I think it's not just saying that it's an unusual process, and it's not just saying that this is a process that's a lot more open to different people or that it tries to be generally uh, robust in terms of something like a test suite or something like that. The phrase personal is a very interesting thing there. And I think mm -hmm. part of what it's implying is that it is important according to the values of the people of the Linux community that people be able to express themselves and feel like their authentic selves in the process of making this software and that in a conflict between my own liberty of expression and someone else's feelings of comfort or safety, the Linux community is coming from a long tradition of personal liberty overruling. And we know this a little bit from what Linus's replies have been in the past mm -hmm. to people asking him to honestly be more of a nurturing leader for that community. He has said, you're seeing my authentic self. It's very important for me to be authentic according to my culture and my personality. And I think that 
as I said earlier, uh, every person who comes into a community has the cap I have the capability within me, you have the capability within you, all of us have the capability of doing things through carelessness or through malign intent to hurt other people. And so I don't actually have necessarily as much trust in the idea that that's the core value that should guide something like a code of conduct, that kind of personal expression thing. Mm -hmm. So that framing makes me a little bit doubtful. Also the fact that in general, people have often found that short codes of conduct are, sure, they, they're good on brevity and concision, they're faster to read, but on the other hand, they don't necessarily make people feel as safe to report things that have gone wrong as more detailed kinds of codes of conduct do that say, here are some specific things we're really not okay with. I also think, I mean, to be honest, when something is this new, right, uh, this was added on uh, March 8th, you know, we're in May, it's about two months later. I honestly don't know, because I haven't been following as much, whether they've dealt with any cases yet mm -hmm. that have been brought to their attention. And that is often the litmus test for these things mm -hmm. is, all right, someone's actually reported an incident, how did you deal with it? Mm -hmm. Well, it seems at least that they are now attempting to provide like a means of contacting help. Um, to say, like, you know, if, you, if you're feeling abuse threatened or otherwise uncomfortable, um, that is not acceptable. Um, it's you are right, and I'm sorry that I, I should have probably pre prefaced all of this by saying that it's a step in the right direction. I'm sorry that I didn't do that. Yeah, well, it's also interesting as I'm reading this, um, anyone who feels personally abused, threatened, or otherwise uncomfortable due to this process. Uh, so it sort of implies that that may happen. Like we're, we're having a process that's very open to criticism and sometimes you may feel abused, threatened, uh, or otherwise uncomfortable because we have this process. And it seems to not actually talk more about sort of the, uh, the normal uh, sort of boundaries that you might want to establish uh, around just general behaviors that even beyond the, the scope of this process itself, like it really just refers to, you know, we're, we're going to criticize your code and, and sometimes you might feel we're going too far. <laughs> like that seems to basically be um, the extent of this particular um, code of conflict. It doesn't go and beyond that. One way to think about that is the process is not just individual patches and bugs being created and dealt with. The process includes all of the things we do as a community, including sort of secondary and tertiary things like holding conferences and having meta discussions and whatnot. I don't know whether that's the intent, but that's, I would read it widely and inclusively as saying, for instance, that the process includes conversations after the conference, at the conference bar, that don't necessarily have anything to do primarily with the Linux kernel, but mm -hmm. that are part of the relationship building that allows this kind of community to function and move forward. Of course, uh, these types of uh, codes of conduct, rules of behavior, um, are only one small aspect um, about being an inclusive community, an open community, and community that empowers marginalized and, and underprivileged uh, groups of people. What else um, is there to it? Uh, like if, if you were building an open or free culture community now, an open stuff community, um, what beyond like the codes uh, of behavior uh, is really important uh, to, uh, as you say, like um, emphasize hospitality um, uh, alongside liberty? When you look at the spectrum of existing, I'm going to say open source software projects as a start, mm -hmm. some of them are a lot better than others at from the start being very inclusive and encouraging lots of different people from a lot of different backgrounds and demographics and skill sets to join in and help make the software better. Grow Stuff and Dream Width and Archive of Our Own have all taken various approaches to this. 
one thing Dreamwith did was really, really early in their development, they created a system called DreamHacks, where anybody just for the asking could get an account on a remote cloud server that already had a development environment all set up. Wikimedia eventually followed in this with some of its Wikimedia Labs and its Vagrant mm -hmm. setups. And uh, Mozilla also ended up following suit. And I'm not saying that this was an influence in any way. Dreamwith was actually first out of all of these projects. Mm -hmm. Dreamwith also has a process called the Code Tour, where any time that they launch uh, an update, they deploy new code to their site, there is a human readable explanation of who did what and how that helps. And this helps demystify everything. They have a newbies IRC channel. They have a community, an online community just for new people. They have open, there are just no such thing as a dumb question threads mm -hmm. and other kinds of demystification efforts to help people. Right now, for instance, they have declared that Open Source Bridge, a conference that they like to go to and that I also like to go to, I keynoted there in 2012, is a conference that they want to help bring people to. So they're saying if you've made at least five pull requests, code contributions to Dreamwith in the past, I can't remember exact, you know, some time period, we would like to pay for your trip. To come and they're very actively encouraging people who have never been to a tech conference before to come and hack with them because that face-to-face -face interaction going to a conference for the first time maybe speaking for the first time is such an important part of growing as a community member and as a technologist and getting interesting life experience there's a number of other things that dream with has done that i i think are pretty great but i should move on now and talk a little bit about grow stuff for instance grow stuff has a project method, uh, a project manager and a leader and a founder, Scud, who had already founded and run other projects before and who is a very experienced open source community manager, leader and programmer. And so they have a, a wide range of connections with people in open source, but they also actively try to get people who are users gardeners of the site because it's a gardening info tracking site to contribute as testers and as people saying what features they want uh, reporting bugs to the site looking over things like designs and giving feedback on those and i think scud has also been doing a tremendous amount of code review of hand holding of pair programming remotely with people to, and that's something that uh, a lot of open source projects could be doing better on is having open offers of, of if you need help because you haven't worked on this bit of code before, I will pair program with you remotely to help get you over that hump. I think that Grow Stuff has also done uh, a lot of interesting work around trying to make Agile into something that works in a distributed remote and volunteer friendly organization uh, to help bring people in to see what, what an iteration is and to have post iteration and post sprint reports that report out to the rest of the community in human friendly language what we accomplished and what the failures were because sometimes failures are easier to learn from than successes. In that context, can you talk a little bit about that poster behind you? Sure, sure, sure. Okay, so I'm not going to, you know, zoom in because I'm sure that you can, can screen share. I will be doing that. And I think I have the poster here. Yep. Be a better mentor. How, how did that poster come about? Did you make it? I created the core text and then Rupa Das Gupta, a designer I know, was willing to take some money in response, uh, and, and uh, she was willing to take some money and in return actually make it look like a useful thing. And I am very grateful. I, I believe in paying people for useful work, mm -hmm. and uh, I was glad that she was willing to let me hire her to help make this. So this was a poster that I presented at PyCon last year, the North American Python convention, during their poster session. And I made this because 
going to hacker school, which is now called the Recurse Center, helped me see some things that were useful in creating spaces that are meant for people to learn in. And I think this is true no matter whether the places place is tri primarily for people to learn in or whether you are simply trying to make a place that is a collaborative workplace also into a place where people can learn as a secondary effect. One thing that I learned at the Recurse Center is about these learning styles because my friend Mel Chua, who is getting a PhD in engineering education and who concentrates on the intersection between open source software as communities of practice and theories of pedagogy and andragogy. She has brought a lot of really useful material about how people learn into Hacker School, now the Recurse Center. And one of them was these four spectra of learning styles. This is somewhat similar to the Myers-Briggs type indicator, which I sometimes also refer to as like horoscopes with four extra. But the more seriously, these are four axes. No spot on any one of these axes is inherently better than another. And people might sort of code switch, right? You might have a temperament that leads you more in one direction, but because your environment rewards you for acting in another direction, you might learn how to be there, but it might not be where you would thrive given the opportunity. And learning that different people really think about engineering in different ways and learn engineering skills in different ways has been extremely helpful to me as a teacher. Um, the engineering learning styles include, for instance, visual and verbal. Do you generally think in words or think in pictures? And I know, Eric, you've talked to me about being an incredibly verbal thinker, thinking a great mm -hmm. deal in words, or at least that was the case in 2011. Is it still the case? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I figured it might be. And I think mostly verbally as well, but I do benefit from some amount of making and looking at diagrams, for instance. And in open source software online right now, if you join an online open source software community, you are going to be flooded with words. We've made it extremely easy to make words, to share words, to read words. But there will generally be a deficit of things like diagrams to help you understand a concept. And similarly, we are a lot better at global, at here, here is a giant code base, look at it in situ, than we are at sequential. It takes effort for us to write tutorials and keep them up to date saying, here is one concept, here is another, here is another. And for larger, more established open source software projects like Drupal, people have gone to the effort of making those things and trying to keep them updated. But for the vast majority of open source software projects, which have under 10 contributors, you're not going to have that. And so open source tends not to help reflective, sequential, intuitive, and visual learners. And we need to make special efforts to help new interns uh, or new learners with those styles. Mm -hmm. And in the poster, um, one of the sections here is the four social rules, uh, no feigning surprise, no well actually, no backseat driving, no subtleisms. Um, how did those four rules come about and how do they manifest in practice? Like what's a well actually, for example, you can imagine, but I'd have to right. talk a bit about it. Sure, sure. Um, I will give you a link to the manual, which goes into a lot of this in more detail. I am not the person who came up with any of those. The people who made them, Nick Berkson Shilcock, Dave Albert, Sonali Schrader, facilitators like Allison Captor, Zach Alon, and so on, uh, some of whom are no longer actually at the Recurse Center, had uh, helped come up with these lightweight guidelines for how we should act to help ourselves and each other learn and to call each other out, hopefully in, in brief graceful interactions or help get help from facilitators to help repair slightly damaged learning environments at the Recurse Center. So I will go into no well actuallys first. A well actually is a pedantic correction of someone else in a way that prioritizes precision over clarity 
and that acts as a dominance display that doesn't help other people learn and that causes other people to be a bit more shut down in the future when venturing to explain something or, or ask a question. So for instance, if I were to say that the GNU public license is basically a product of the late 70s, and I'm saying this in the context of a discussion of open source and free software as a whole, and you correct me with the actual date that the GPL was first published, which I believe was in the early 80s, that is not the most helpful thing you could be doing right there. And now there are errors that I might make that would actually cause the person that I'm talking to to make errors and that would hurt them in their learning. So for instance, if I say something like Python is the only interpreted language, then you know that, that's a, a good idea to jump in and correct that. But if I say Python is an interpreted language, and then you jump in and say that it is compiled. Well, okay, fine. Technically, that's true because there is a compiler involved. But in general, we are fine with referring to it in shorthand as an interpreted language. And it's going to be more helpful to the person that I'm talking to to think of it as an interpreted language compared to, for instance, C, which we generally call a compiled language, right? Mm -hmm. And so the a way to know that something is a well actually is that the is to introspect and to find out that the place that it's coming from in oneself is an urge to show off mm -hmm. an urge to display to everybody else how smart you are and how much you know and how much you deserve to be there but everyone deserves to be there so is that really a helpful thing to do mm -hmm. and i find that sure there is a gray line there where there are things that I might say and I decide not to say because I'm just not sure whether it's a well actually or not. And that's okay. It is okay that sometimes I might accidentally fall on the wrong line of this. And in fact, I've fallen on the wrong line of probably all four of these rules and people have nicely said, so many that's kind of a well actually, or that's a bit of backseat driving. And I've called other people out and it's okay. We're in a trust relationship with each other because we're all recursors together and we know that we're aiming to help each other be better recursors and make the space safe for everybody else. I know that the fact that there were no well actually is, and there was no feigned surprise, none of that, you don't know what an array is, none of that, made it so the first week that I was at the Recurse Center, I said, I don't know, probably a million times, because it felt safe to do it. It felt safe to allow people to see that I was ignorant because no one was going to say to me that that means that you don't belong. And all of these rules are towards that end. They make it mm -hmm. a safe place to display ignorance and then to overcome it by learning and by making stuff and, and potentially failing as well. That's very important. Yeah, and so we've talked a lot about um, hospitality and, and mentorship in sort of generic terms um, in the context of open communities. How, how do we become more inclusive? But of course, um, the largest group of people uh, who is underrepresented in open stuff communities is women. And you've been involved. Uh, in I will actually correct you. And I think the largest group that's underrepresented is people who do not speak English. Mm -hmm. So is that um, like when you think about your own main focus, um, you have focused a lot on women in tech um, as opposed to, for example, people who do not speak English, but do you see right. your own priorities? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I aim to be an intersectional feminist, mm -hmm. which is to say that I care about oppressions other than the ones that directly impact me. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, it's just a bit short-sighted. And I would rather, um, I, I know that it's, it's, it can be difficult to do that, partly because we are all sort of naturally self-centered, right? We see the world through um, as we see it, because that's our experience. I try to, for instance, strip ableist language out of my speech, which means that I shouldn't have said short-sighted a little while ago, as though that's, you know, inherently, that's a, that's a failing of a person to, for instance, wear glasses, which I do. Uh, and I think that 
I have been most able to see what needs doing and to accomplish it and to be a role model and a mentor when it comes to gender diversity in open mm. stuff because I have the experiences of a woman. I think that I am somewhat more useful than most white people in open stuff when it comes to ethnic diversity because I do have the experiences of a person of color. Mm -hmm. I am an Asian American and as such, I am overrepresented in terms of ethnicity in technology in the US, but I am underrepresented compared to that and compared to population uh, in, in the US when it comes to open stuff. I have very, very frequently been the only brown person in the room mm -hmm. in open stuff communities. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if I am more frequently the only brown person in the room than the only woman in the room in a lot of open stuff communities. For instance, when I was on the board of directors of the Ada Initiative, I was, I believe, the only person of color on that board. And and that was, you know, a group, a group full of women. And I care about, for instance, gender diversity. I care about not assuming that everybody is neurotypical. I care about making sure that we have ways for people to at least use open source who do not speak English. I honestly am not sure that I have it in me to address the problem of how monolingual open source making communities are, mm -hmm. but it's something that's at least worth thinking about mm -hmm. uh, in terms of having on-ramps. For instance, we have made some inroads in that by, for instance, having places where people can at least test the software and learn how to use the software in languages other than English. And there are open source communities where there are thriving uh, French or Spanish, for instance, uh, communities. Where, but, but even so, in general, in order to really reach the top of those communities, you need to be able to speak English at a sort of professional level. Class is something I've been thinking about a lot when it comes to open stuff because of a few things. One, it becomes clear how visiting places and seeing other people face to face is extremely useful to grow as a contributor and to rise in our hierarchies. And that is something that not everyone has the money and the time to do. It is very good that we have scholarship programs like the participation support program at Wikimedia, like what I mentioned that DreamWith does. A number of other communities also do this. Uh, there are conferences like PyCon that have scholarship programs. There are open source software projects that have stra uh, travel and scholarship funds. And the work that the Ada Initiative does is, is very interesting and it's as far as i know a unique uh, in scale and scope um, as a, an organization entirely dedicated uh, to supporting uh, women specifically uh, in open technology not just women in technology but women in open technology communities so i want to clarify that the ada initiative cares about open technology and culture and this includes open technology like media wiki and linux and it includes open culture like Wikipedia, open data, political activism, fanfic and fan vids. All of these are things we make together using collaborative processes and where the end result is stuff that other people can remix and reuse for our own purposes. And it's important for all of these things for us to increase women's participation and status in those activities. And in terms right. of the, the programs that the initiative um, uh, is, is running, what have you found um, that, that works particularly well uh, to create more inclusive environments? So, and I should clarify and just make sure people know once more that I am not uh, affiliated with the Ada Initiative at this moment, mm -hmm. but uh, I can give my perspective as someone who has been a part of the advisory board and the board of directors and who has used these services as well. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So a few things that it's done that are particularly effective. One, creating resources such as the ally skills training and the anti-harassment policy that can then be reused in other places. I myself 
built the friendly space policy for Wikimedia Foundation technical events based on the ADA initiative policy. And I was able to customize it for our needs because again, it's open, it's under an open license, people can reuse and remix it. But the core of it was something that had been tested and already had the vast majority of the pros that I would need. The ally skills training at Wikiconference USA last year, when I walked into what was supposed to be a diversity training and I found out the trainer had not shown up, people said, well, I guess we're just going to have a open group discussion. And I thought for a moment about how useless so many of those things are when there's no facilitator, there's no guiding purpose. It just leads to a lot of platitudes and often a lot of pedantic nitpicking. And I said, I could lead an ADA initiative branded ally skills training and the PDF was available online and I could just go through it on the projector and lead people through some scenarios so they could think through, here is an actual scenario, what would I do in response to this in order to be a better ally to marginalized people, especially women in open technology and culture. And it was a big hit and people found it extremely useful to help them practice what their responses would be so they could be better allies. Those kinds of resources, including the imposter syndrome training are useful and people speak about how useful they are. I think they could be more useful. I think that for instance, the ally skills training currently doesn't have an actual role play component mm -hmm. where people practice saying or doing those things. And so therefore there is a danger that people might now know what the right thing is to do, but not quite have the gumption to say or do it in the moment. There's always room to improve and there's room for other people to build off of this after all. Another thing that the Ada Initiative does is consulting for organizations that want to get better at diversity. And so for instance, the there are organizations that have hired the Ada Initiative to help improve their hiring processes. And you, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I was just curious, you had mentioned earlier this, this imposter syndrome training, and I would love to dig into that a little bit, um, if you don't mind. Sure, I'll get into that in a second. Yeah. Sure. Um, and the last thing is the Ada Camp convenings. Mm -hmm. So the Ada Initiative has get togethers called Ada Camp, which are somewhat structured unconferences. So they're sort of on the border, right, between conference and unconference for people to whom identifying as a woman in some way is important to them. This is meant to be a very inclusive event of people who are gender queer and gender fluid or trans. And the point of it is to bring together people from lots of different bits of open stuff and open culture for networking, for skill sharing, and for network building. And this has been helpful to a lot of people, especially in helping them find people who to collaborate on projects with and to help them see they're not alone and to build skills like negotiating and uh, sometimes really help them see that whatever stories they're feeling are not alone. There's also an ongoing network then, there's a mailing list for Ada Camp alumni that's been a pretty useful resource to people. So you wanna talk about imposter syndrome? Mm -hmm. Yeah, particularly like even outside of the, the context of, of the work that Ada is doing, like. Um, what is it and um, why why does it keep coming up as, as something that um, people who care about building inclusive communities um, talk about? Like, um, what does it describe? Is it something that people should be aware of? Imposter syndrome is a term that was coined by people who are not me and generally refers to a problem that happens, especially to people of a marginalized community in professions where success is a bit unclear or there aren't as clear rules for assessing the value of work and for getting promoted or moving forward. And it's generally thought of, one, one way to think about it is that feeling that at any moment everyone will discover that you are a fraud. Mm -hmm. It happens more often to women, but it also happens to men. And there's been recently a lot of discussion about how we avoid labeling simply all feelings of lack of confidence or insecurity as imposter syndrome, because after all, there is such a thing as simply legitimately knowing that you're not very good at this thing that you're attempting to do. And so I would recommend, for instance, Kate Houston's recent article in, I think, Model View Culture about that. But fundamentally to me, imposter syndrome has been a problem of epistemology, of how do you know 
this thing, this assessment of whether or not you are good enough. What is good enough? And are you assessing yourself fairly? And are you assessing other people by that same scale? I find that for me, again, I don't want to uh, too much conflate descriptive and prescriptive, but for me, a very helpful thing for imposter syndrome has been confronting that anxious voice in my head with the need to be a bit more logical and structured and objective about what would success look like? I know that it's been helpful to me, for instance, to think, okay, what would some good criteria be for success at this thing? And then check, have I actually achieved those things? Mm -hmm. And I think recognizing that people in an environment without objective criteria are going to flounder and some people will act and feel more entitled and some people will act and feel less entitled is a useful thing to remember for anyone who is any kind of leadership role in a community, in an organization, in a family, uh, or any kind of governance structure, really. Because part of what that means, then, is if you attempt a kind of anarchy or structurelessness or holacracy or yeah. whatever the buzzword of the week is for not doing the actual work it needs to manage an organization, uh, whatever excuse for laziness is the current <laughs> bad, um, if you engage in that, then the people who, from the time they were young, were groomed to be entitled and to be rewarded every time they raise their hands are going to raise their hands. And the people who, in every environment they've been in, have been subtly or bluntly slapped down every time they raise their hands, you're not going to be able to undo that 99 uh, subsequent uh, uh, 99 consecutive events by adding one, no, really, it's fine this time. And so you're going to need to encourage people. You're going to need to nurture people. You're going to need to put out um, guidelines for what success looks like. You're going to need to sometimes create help before you see the demand. Mm -hmm. And not, you won't necessarily be able to be data-driven in a very naive way where as soon as you see a problem, then you react to it. You may have to be a bit more empathetic and thoughtful and imaginative of what would it look like if everyone actually felt equally comfortable asking for help, asking for a raise, asking for a promotion uh, or what have you. And mm -hmm. so I think that one part of addressing imposter syndrome is recognizing uh, that not everyone has been equally privileged with entitlement, with a feeling mm -hmm. of entitlement. Have you looked at uh, some of the, the way that Khan Academy tries to sort of teach people that failure is okay and that it's actually like a, an indicator to your brain that you're learning something right now. It's hard and you're gonna like make a few mistakes and that's part of the process. I have not run into that. I have had many experiences at the Recurse Center mm -hmm. which were helpful in this way. Mm -hmm. Allison Kapter, who was a facilitator at the Richter Center for a few years, was a person that I pair programmed with, I think on day two. And she was pair programming with me on something and she used a phrase. And, you know, two weeks prior, I might have just nodded and smiled and tried to go with it and learn from context. But at the Richter Center, I was going to actually face this fear. And so I sort of squared my shoulders and took a breath and said, I don't know what that is. And so we veered off course from what we thought we were going to be doing. And instead I learned this concept that was incredibly useful. It had something to do with classes. I don't remember what it was specifically. Maybe I'd never written a subclass before actually. And then as I was getting up, I, I stood to leave and then I turned to Allison and I said, I need you to reassure me and tell me that you don't think I'm dumb because I didn't know that thing. And she said, no, you have just done the most hacker school thing you could do, which is recognize you didn't know something, admit it, and then learn it, high five. <laughs> cool. And she was helpful to me and a lot of her curse center community has been helpful to me in helping us remember that learning things, especially things that were, um, learning things is often hard. 
it's especially hard to learn things where we have a very immature community of practice and extremely immature practices. So learning to sew, people have been sewing for a lot of years. We have much better communities and practices and tools. Every time that I, when doing sort of intro to sewing, thought, ah, I'm having such and such a problem, I realized, oh, this is what this tool is for. That is shaped to fit my hand. After all, like, in fact, a woman's pinky finger, in fact. Whereas if you are trying to learn, for instance, how to do something in Python 3, we have not had thousands of years to smooth all the rough edges of that. And so learning anything is going to include two steps forward, one step back, and learning things where no one has designed them and millions of years or thousands or hundreds of years of people doing those things haven't smoothed the rough edges, that is going to be especially hard. And so that is important to remember. And I hope that it, one reason I am so transparent in my blogging, for instance, and I write about failures that I've had, and I try and, for instance, track how much time it takes me to do a new thing so I can say, hey, I'm making this fan vid. This is the most complicated thing I've ever done. It's going to be three minutes long. It will take hundred, uh, more than 100 hours once I'm all done. It's important to share that. So you had mentioned earlier on that one of your passions is also humor. Can you talk a little bit yeah. more about that? Sure, sure, sure. So I realized that now I should sort of do a bit of show and tell um, and say that uh, in from the time that I was quite young, mm -hmm. I was trained by my parents to be OK with appearing on stage. And we would constantly have family get togethers where they would sort of shove a mic into my hand and I was fine with this. And so it wasn't just an inborn thing, it was also nurtured by my family that I was completely fine giving speeches and talks and, uh, and also telling other people jokes and I inherit some of my love of terrible wordplay from my dad, for instance. Um, but for probably more than 10 years now, I've done stand-up comedy as well, uh, which my strain of it is very much observational, cerebral, and absurd. And I also attempt to demonstrate that you can have stand-up comedy that is not hurtful, that you don't need to be sexist or homophobic or transphobic or what have you in your comedy in order to make people laugh. Um, I'm okay with scatology, you know, I will talk about, uh, I'll, use, I'll, I'll use some profanity or I'll talk about poop or something like that, but uh, I won't make anyone feel less than, I won't make anyone feel othered because they happen to show up at my show. In 2011, I did a set of about 25 to 30 minutes of very open source centric comedy at a number of conferences around the United States. And this year, Ash Dryden, the open source diversity leader, has asked me to do some stand-up comedy at AlterConf, which is at, uh, just after Open Source Bridge in Portland on June 27th. And I would encourage you to come and be there. I can show you that, um, so for instance, let's see, I think here is, I hope you won't actually be able to read it, but mm -hmm. this is uh, a notebook that I've been writing a lot of notes in for my comedy. And then I went through that plus a bunch of my old notes from previous bits that I'd done. And I sort of just wrote um, a bunch of stuff, uh, jokes, sort of jokes in shorthand on this page um, and, and this one. And then I ended up, I, I, I work a lot better on paper and I also work a lot better with scraps mm -hmm. because I think there's a part of me when it comes to art, when it comes to things I'm making like whether it's fan vids or fanfic or comedy, there's a part of me that doesn't feel 100% confident about using fresh paper. And mm -hmm. I like knowing that I'm being sort of Puritan and virtuous by reusing scraps, whether that means working in someone else's universe with fanfic and fan vids or writing you know, on the back of paper that was going to be recycled. Um, so then I have this big, thing with a lot of arrows about um, what all of the directions are that I'm going to go from topic to topic to topic, which is also something that I did when I was teaching. Um, mm -hmm. I find that stand up and teaching have a lot in common because you're sort of trying to get people from one idea to another and having natural segues is very helpful to that. 
And so then I perform, I get laughs or I don't, I get a, an audio recording of that so I can listen to it later with a great deal of wincing and note down what worked, what didn't work, what jokes came out of the, off the top of my head. And then, uh, you know, iterate and so on until I hope June 27th I have a pretty good performance. So well, that's uh, some, some of the stuff about my stand-up comedy. And I would encourage people to come and see me in Portland on June 27th as part of AlterCon. And what I really appreciate about the way you talk about this stuff is that you're always willing to share the internals of what you do um, with people. And I found the same thing true about the, the sci-fi anthology that, that you and Leonard Richardson created a few years ago. Um, and there's like, so this is like an anthology of short stories. And then there's like that final appendix and the anthology is like, if you want to do this yourself, here's how you go about doing it, which I thought was pretty cool. So I really appreciate that in everything you do, everything that I've seen you do, you're willing to make it transparent, the be a better mentor instructions, the many blog posts, the many articles that, that you've written, that you're sharing so openly and so freely what you're learning as you're learning it, um, and therefore building a, a better and more hospitable, open and free culture community for all of us. So thank you so much, Sumana, and thank you for sharing your passion with us today. Thank you. Have a great day. You too.